Good morning, everyone. The living tradition we share as Unitarian Universalists draws from many sources. Our service today will be about how the concept of justice is woven through those services, those sources, I'm sorry. To our people joining us on Zoom, if you have a candle or chalice for our shared chalice lighting, you'll want it nearby. And you also might want to have paper and pen or a journal handy for our reflection time. It's going to be a little while, actually. Sorry. I have some other things here I'm supposed to say first. Sorry about that. <laughs> Tan say hello and bonjour. Westwood respectfully acknowledges that we're gathered today on Treaty 6 land, a land that is rich in history, some small part of it being the history of settlers who've lived and worked here and most of it being in the hearts and minds of the Indigenous peoples who have inhabited and stewarded this land through countless centuries, countless millennia. This is, and has been, a traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous peoples and the Métis. As citizens of Canada, we are all treaty people, no matter how short or long our relationship with this land has been. As treaty people, we must be responsible for continued stewardship of this land and for living in right relation and reciprocity with all its peoples. We're a part of the legacy of this land which we inhabit, which will one day be inhabited by our descendants. Good morning and welcome to Westwood. My name is Jacqueline Willett, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm your service facilitator and musician this morning. The original service today was going to feature singer, drummer, world champion, powwow dancer, Ryan Arkand, but he's been called away to a funeral. Thank you to Lorian Kennedy, who's doing duty back here as our tech person as well, for her work yesterday in researching and organizing the service we are having today. Our technicians on Zoom, Bill Lee, and here are Hannah and Lorian. We give a special welcome to anyone who might be new here today. Thank you to all of you for making the time to gather together where we center and focus on the things that bring meaning and purpose to our lives and then share a little bit of social time. May this flame, symbol of transformation since time began, fire our curiosity, strengthen our wills, and sustain our courage as we seek what is good within and around us. We light our chalices this morning in the spirit of justice. Now we're going to sing. It'll be on the screen, but some of you I noticed picked up books, so you'll want the silver one, and it's number 66. When the summer sun is shining, it's an aspirational song. <laughs>
It is the practice of this congregation to have a time for sharing the joys and concerns of our lives. Sharing in this way brings us closer together as a community. For those of us who are online, please raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you. For those in the building, you're invited to come forward and speak, then light your candle as the next person speaks, or to light a candle in silence. We're also happy to bring the microphone to you if you wish. And today we will begin with candles from those of us who are online. One last candle then, one last candle, for all those joys and concerns which remain stuffed safely in our hearts. And our affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to do our powers, to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Contributions of time and talent, as well as your financial support, are what sustains our congregations. If you wish to make a financial contribution, the information for doing so is on the right-hand side of the slide. There is a basket, I believe it is, sitting on the welcome table if you're wanting to drop off a check or something like that. And there are envelopes both there and in the backs of the chairs if you're wanting your contribution to be um, noted for the purposes of a tax receipt next winter. And I hope you'll join with me as we sing, From You I Receive. And next, another song. We are gentle, angry people. It's number 170 if you have one of those silver books with you. And if not, it'll be there on the screen.
Our topic this morning is justice, and especially how it shows up in our six Unitarian Universalist sources. In the recent past, Westwood reflected on themes based on the six UU sources. Our sources are the wells we draw upon for strength, wisdom, comfort, and to be challenged in our personal lives, but also collectively in community. The slide you see is Westwood's short version of the six UU sources. And I invite you to read along with me, either aloud or in your head, whatever works. So our six Unitarian Universalist sources are experiences of wisdom and wonder which feed our spirits, words and deeds that inspire us to love, wisdom from the world's religions, Jewish and Christian teachings of God's call to love our neighbor, humanist teachings of reason and science, and earth-centered traditions celebrating the sacred circle of life. Thank you. Now, I have a few readings to share with you. I'll begin with an excerpt from the Boston, a Boston Globe article. And this is about Eli Weasel. I hope I've said his name correctly. If I survived, it might be for some reason, Eli Wiesel spoke those words in a New York Times interview back in 1981. Throughout his life, Wiesel lived with purpose and lent meaning to his survival. As a witness to the most extreme atrocities and in his lifetime as an activist, he changed the way we think about human rights and the way we understand our responsibility to each other. Wiesel opened a window to the unimaginable. His own story and the loss of his mother, father, and younger sister made it impossible for readers to ignore the horror of the concentration camps. Truth and honesty about ourselves and our history is vital for all people and for our de democracy. As he wrote, to forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. Wiesel frequently pointed out that the opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. He urged us to not stand by and reminded us that acknowledgement of injustice alone is not enough. In his Nobel acceptance speech in 1986, Wiesel called us to action. As long as one dissident is in prison, he said, our freedom will not be true. As long as one child is hungry, our life will be filled with anguish and shame. What all these victims need, above all, is to know that they are not alone, that we are not forgetting them, that when their voices are stifled, we shall lend them ours, that while their freedom depends on ours, the quality of our freedom depends upon theirs. And now we'll move on to a CBC News report. There are 231 steps that need to be taken by governments and Canadians in order to end the genocide against Indigenous women and girls, according to the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. The report says that these are calls for justice. It must be understood that these recommendations, which we frame as calls for justice, are legal imperatives. They are not optional, the report reads. These calls for justice represent important ways to end the genocide and to transform systemic and societal values that have worked to maintain colonial violence. And from the final report, there are eight calls for justice for all Canadians. I'm not going to read them all, but they do include the following. Denounce and speak out against violence toward Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, questioning, intersex, and asexual people. Decolonize by learning the true history of Canada and Indigenous history in your local area. 
learn about and celebrate Indigenous people's history, cultures, pride, and diversity, acknowledging the land you live on and its importance to local Indigenous communities, both historically and today. Another one. Develop knowledge and read the final report. Listen to the truths shared and acknowledge the burden of these human and Indigenous rights violations and how they impact people, real people. Confront and speak out against racism, sexism, ignorance, homophobia, transphobia, and teach or encourage others to do the same wherever it occurs, whether that's in your home, in your workplace, or in social settings. Create time and space for relationships based on respect as human beings, supporting and embracing differences with kindness, love, and respect. Learn about Indigenous principles of relationship specific to those nations or communities in your community and put them into practice in all of your relationships with Indigenous peoples. Here, coming up on this next slide, is the full version of the second source upon which you use draw for wisdom and inspiration. Words and deeds of prophetic people which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. In just a moment, we will play a piece of music and you'll have a few minutes to reflect on a question. That's why you've got the paper and pencil. But you may want to sit and meditate, or you can write your thoughts on the piece of paper or in your journal. The music is about three and a half minutes long. When it's done, I'll read the question again, and if you wish, you can share your answers. So here's the question. Whose words or deeds have inspired your experience or understanding of justice? Could be anyone, fictional or real, famous or hardly known, alive or no longer with us. Whose words and deeds have inspired your experience or understanding of justice? And now for some music and time to contemplate. Thank you. 
either from Zoom land or from people sitting here in the room. We're talking about whose words or deeds have inspired your experience or understanding of justice. I thought of several people that inspire me, but one is somebody I know, and that's Mufti Mathewson. She's a friend of this congregation, a longtime friend of mine, and a member of our camera club. And she started asking people to take pictures of red dresses to bring attention to uh, murdered and missing Indigenous women. Um, other photographers contributed. That became a really big big event that traveled across the country and out of the country to show this exhibit with hundreds of pictures. Um, and somehow it's just really moving when you see all of those pictures. It's more than just hearing about it. It's, it's seeing it. It makes it visual and it really then hits home. Um, so I think that was something one person could do that multiplied all over and it was really inspirational. Um, well, the person who inspired me came to mind immediately was Miranda Jimmy, because probably because we've just seen her. Um, but uh, I, she's quite an inspirational person. All her work that she's done to educate the settler population about the injustice of the treaties not being upheld by the people who made them. Justice for in, Indigenous people should begin with, uh, to my mind this is, Justice for Indigenous people should begin with acknowledgement of the injustice and proceed then to atonement and to redress. And that would be what justice would mean to me. Um, at the uh, retirement banquet the other day, um, the president of the local of the ATA did a, a very personal land acknowledgement. Um, it was long and it was very compelling and um, we all listened very carefully to it. And uh, then when Jacqueline was, was reading her acknowledgement this morning, I, I realized I have not found the right words to personalize my own um, so inspired by, by those two, um, I, I think mine is going to say something like, what would our world and our environment and our relationships be like if the colonists had embraced the indigenous relationship with the natural world? And if they, if they had seen themselves as part of the natural world? And I, I, I'm, now that I've put it in words, I, I know that's what I have been grieving as a, a person in 2023. And um, I had another, uh, another thought I would like to say is that um, this year I had the most profound experience of singing um, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Um, the, the words were written by uh, Frederick Schiller and um, Beethoven truly felt those words that were all about um, erasing the, the boundaries between us that are all artificial and bringing all of humankind together. Lindsay would like to speak. I, uh mostly wrote down names of people, um, my father to start with. Um, Martin Luther King got me to understand that life wasn't the same for people of a different color. Um, a woman that I had a store on White Avenue, Betty Taylor, 
just exemplified um, being fair and kind to everyone. And I don't need to explain the next two, Elaine, Robert, and Jack Allen. Thank you. It's funny that Lindsay should mention her dad, because certainly my mom was my first teacher about justice and equity. And early lessons about fairness and treating people, all people, with dignity and all things and beings with respect. And I think it was a really strong base upon which I was then able to learn about justice in other ways. One of the people that comes to mind is Gandhi. He was probably one of the first that I learned about. And the people mentioned in this room already are all real models in my mind. Is there anyone else who has something to say at this point? I'll just say two and you can say it. But okay. The person to add to our rest of the people on my list is Carl. Carl Ulrich. Yes, Carl Ulrich is pretty amazing. Yeah, and certainly an example. Thank you. Let's move on to the rest of our readings. These are the words of Donald E. Robinson, and they were published in Voices from the Margins. Many people use the term social justice in self-serving ways. What they mean by social justice is just us. But social justice can only begin with the interaction between fortunate people and those who are disadvantaged. It is incumbent upon those who, by virtue of the accident of birth or other circumstances, have good jobs, good educational background, and good lives to come to the assistance of those who face formidable obstacles to getting an education and leading fulfilling lives. Social injustice, sorry, social justice insists that people are not their circumstances, they are their possibilities. Social justice demands that all people, regardless of their birth circumstances, are entitled to a fair chance at life that every person has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Black abolitionist Frederick Douglass wrote in 1895, where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. And this is from Hebrew scripture. He has told you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to humbly walk with your God. That's from Micah 6, 8. And finally, the words of Teresa Soto from Spilling the Light. Bring your broken hallelujah here. Bring the large one that is beyond repair. Bring the small one that's too soft to share. Bring your broken hallelujah here. I know that people have told you that before you can give, you have to get yourself together. They overstated the value of perfection by a lot, or they forgot. You are the gift. We all bring some broken things, or songs, or dreams, and long lost hopes. But here, together, we reach within. As a community, we begin again. And from the pieces, we build something new. There is work that only you can do. And we wait for you. 
And our next slide has the six sources again. I'll just give you a chance to look them over. And the question, which sources have had a part in shaping your experience of or your approach to justice? Which sources have had a part in shaping your experience of or your approach to justice? We'll have some more music. So which sources then have had a part in shaping your experience or your approach to justice? Is there anything you'd like to share this morning? I don't like standing at microphones, really. Um, well, I would say probably um, the uh, humanist teachings about reason and science, because in fact, when you think about it, justice is uh, tied quite closely to morality and morality is something which is amenable to scientific study and there are actually theories of morality and i scraped the surface of some of those while i was doing a degree um uh, some years ago um but anyway so there's this tie up between um, morality and justice and even in in our readings in some of the free thinkers book club books they touch um on morality issues and make you think about um issues of um uh the worth of of uh, one person um, balanced against the uh, needs um, of another person and uh, so there is there's this business of the scales of justice um, involved in some of that moral thinking um, so i would say humanist teachings of reason and science that make you think 
in a clear scientific way about what is just. Thanks, Cassie. Anyone else? Is there someone on Zoom who would like to add something? As a young person, I was brought up in the Christian tradition, and I'm sure that that's where my mom got so many of her ideas and her morality from. And as I grew older and learned about more of the world's religions, I discovered that, you know, there's just this commonality amongst everyone who, who chooses to think about what's good for all. And, um, that's really quite amazing if you think about it, that all people in the world who want to do good have a strong sense of justice, that that's part of the very basis of morality. So I guess number three and number four are kind of the ones I'm talking about right now. Well, thank you for your sharing your thoughts this morning. It's created more richness in my life and hopefully in yours as well. We're going to sing another song. And that's Blue Boat Home. It's a Westwood favorite. And I'm expecting you to sing out.
Oh, that was just lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're going to extinguish our flame now. This is called the Prayer for Living in Tension by In Tension by Joseph Cherry, and it's published in the book Voices from the Margins. If we have any hope of transforming the world and changing ourselves, we must be bold enough to step into our discomfort. Clumsy there, loving enough to forgive ourselves and others. May we, as a people of faith, be granted the strength to be so bold, so brave, and so loving. <laughs>